but I think we'll we'll get going. There'll be people that will will filter in. Uh, that's okay. kind of the nature of the beast and whatever. But I, I do want to welcome all the all the members, you know, for joining us uh, for this this uh, this program. I think it's going to be a, a great one. I'm my name is Dave Hall. For those of you that don't know me, I think most of you do. But I'm actually substituting for Sean Slade uh, tonight. Sean's the the program uh, chair, but uh, unfortunately he travels a lot, so he asked me to to sit in for him, which I was more than happy to do. Um, one of the things that I will make note of is at our next meeting, uh, which is I think on the 27th of October, we're going to vote on proposed changes to the club bylaws and um, and the constitution. So I know Carl uh, Peschel, our webmaster, sent out an email. I, I believe it was October the 4th. Uh, so I would encourage everyone to read that PDF and and show up and you know know what you're voting for. So we'll we'll have a vote on that. And that kind of segues into our, our next meeting, which is the competition meeting on on the on the 27th of October. And that's going to be open. Um, so anything goes that you know that you can enter any topic that you wish. I think the goal, um, the stated goal from the, the, the competition group that Cliff Stockdale and which Bazooka you know, kind of organize is, you know, try different techniques. I mean, if you, if you don't do abstracts, maybe try abstracts or, you know, just do something out of what you normally do. But I think that, you know, that, that's, that's, that's a hope. That's not a, really a demand, but that's, that's always something that's beneficial to try. The judge in two weeks is Kevin Holliday. Uh, Kevin is a former member of Focus Camera Club. He, uh, he moved to Charleston, South Carolina. A number of years ago, but he is going to be the judge. He's a phenomenal photographer. And I would uh, so he'll he'll introduce himself and have some things to say. So I would, would encourage you to check him out. Uh, yes, I know that Carl sent me a list of there were four people that um, that were that that potential guests for tonight. One is Dave Besson, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, Dave. Uh, so I would encourage you to. To maybe say a few words, we talked a little bit earlier about this, so I kind of gave you a heads up of maybe kind of what you want to say, of you know, kind of types of photography that you enjoy, how you found focus, what you're wanting to learn, et cetera, et cetera. Hey, hey so, Dave, but, but before we do that, I just want to correct the, the judge. We did have a change up, and oh. it's going to be, um, yeah, yeah, Kevin had some personal things going on, wasn't able to do it, so it'll be Jeff Johnson. Okay. I've also been a judge in the past, but um, yeah, that's, that's who we'll have in, in two weeks. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the correction. So, I mean, Jeff has judged for us and presented to us. So he's, he's an excellent, excellent person to, to judge. He's very fair and very well respected. So, so thanks for the clarification. Cliff. So I'll let you go ahead, Dave, and tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Thanks, Dave. Um, and your pronunciation was spot on. So uh, no worries there. Um, so I've been shooting since I was in my single digit years. So that's probably, I don't know, 55 years ago or so. Um, and uh, with, with kids and all, I you know, kind of stepped back from it and uh, they're all grown. And I just retired about uh, two weeks ago. So um, now I have time to actually dig in and, and uh, have some fun, uh, which is uh, what, uh, what I want to do. Uh, in terms of background, I was also in the media industry, the newspaper, the, the late newspaper industry for many, many years, working with a lot of photojournalists and building photo archives um, uh, for newspaper chains. And it was uh, you know, fascinating work. Uh, I got to work with some, some really talented uh, um, artists uh, who, who work on deadlines. Um, so it was been on, on crazy deadlines, but uh, um, a lot of fun. In terms of what I like to shoot, um, I've, I've done a lot of work over the years with um, the textures and macro, um, but I'm broadening my horizons. I've been doing more and more landscape and wildlife uh, work of late um, and uh, dabbling in the abstract um, and uh, enjoying it, I'm surprising myself. So that's a, a capsule summary. Well, that's great. Now you have the time since you're retired, you know. Yes. So hopefully you can get out and, and do some of that. But you know, I would, like I mentioned before, Dave, I would strongly encourage you to to attend the meeting next, you know, in two weeks, and kind of get a sense of feel for 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 the club, what what we have for, you know, for for photographers and photographs, and and you know, a lot of our images are 
uh, recorded and up on the web under resources. So, right. So thank you very much for for joining us tonight. Appreciate that. Thank you, and thank you for letting me uh, join tonight. Oh, your it's our pleasure. So, and I think I'll segue and unless anybody any of the members have any announcements that they'd like to make of if there's upcoming shows or anything, I just wanted to give you guys an opportunity to to say anything. So. And nobody's speaking up, so we'll segue into, into Nate. So Nate Luby, uh, I'm very, very you know pleased to 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 introduce Nate as our speaker for for tonight. Um, I know that on the website it, the his program was launching a camera into the stratosphere to capture the northern lights, the aurora borealis. And so I think Nate and I were talking a little bit earlier this week, and he's going to kind of delve into the evolution of that idea, what happened to, and and then. How we pulled it off. So I think it, it's going to be interesting with a good background on that. So, well, Nate, I'm going to let you take over um, and introduce yourself and talk talk a little bit about uh, some of the products and workshops that you offer. So, but thank you very much for joining us, and and I'll turn the, everything over to you. I would encourage everyone to mute themselves if you could. So, other than Nate, and then we'll. <laughs> because that's it. we don't want that. So anyway, but thank you, Nate, take over, thanks. Okay. My girlfriend would probably tell you that she wishes I was muted a little bit more frequently, but uh, for the purposes of this, we'll, we'll leave my mic on. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much for having me. Uh, my name is Nate Luby. I unfortunately do not live in Colorado anymore, but I did grow up there. So I still consider myself a Colorado citizen, even though I am unfortunately in Utah now, but um, I feel like I'm part of the camera club anyways, because it's my home state. Um, yeah, so I guess just a little bit about me. I'm a, a travel and adventure photographer, which is a very millennial sounding job title, but um, it basically just means that I go to exotic locations and I take photos. I do a lot of work with uh, DMOs, destination marketing organizations. So uh, companies like Visit Montana or Travel Alaska, so like the actual government organizations responsible for tourism. And then I work with outdoor gear brands like uh, Outdoor Research, Eddie Bauer, stuff like that, as well as uh, I'm an ambassador for Sony. So uh, the number one question people always ask after that is if I hate every other camera brand, and the answer is no, so don't feel any shame if you shoot Nikon or Canon or Fuji or anything. Uh, I like them all. I'm just on the Sony team. So for the purposes of this, everything I'm discussing will be Sony cameras because that's what I, I shoot on. Um, and then, yeah, as Dave said, um, Sean actually asked me about this a long time ago and my schedule got way too busy. But last year I undertook a project called Light Side Up where uh, my team and I launched a Sony A7S III under a weather balloon into the stratosphere. And we became, to our knowledge, the, the first people to get cinematic quality footage of the Northern Boreal, of the Northern Lights from the edge of space. Um, we got up to just about 120,000 feet. We made a full documentary about it, which is actually available to watch on YouTube for free. So if anyone here hasn't seen it, you can just go, go watch it. There's no cost or anything. Uh, I'm pretty proud of it. It's probably the biggest project I've ever undertaken and has ended up being a little bit of a building block for the, the next stages in my career, which has been really fun. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna, I guess, kind of dive into like the making of, um, everyone always has kind of different interests and questions about what it takes to pull something like this off. So I have an outline here with me of things I'm gonna talk about and I have some you know, multimedia things to share in terms of photos and videos from the project, but please don't be shy about interrupting and asking any questions as they come up because this is a very like weird and sort of exotic concept. And there's a lot, everyone always has questions, which I think is awesome because this project started as a question. So I totally get it. Don't feel shy. You can type them into the chat down there or, you know, turn on your camera and raise your hand or just start talking or whatever. But uh, yeah, not offended at all. If you have any questions about it, I, I love that because that's, that's what we're here for. Um, I guess maybe I should start it off with like playing the trailer in case anyone hasn't seen it. We can play like the trailer for the film, kind of give a little bit of an introduction as to what specifically is happening and, and how it all looks. Does that sound good? All right, let me share my screen.
All right, let me know if you can't hear the volume. This isn't a story about just taking a cool photo. And this isn't a story about traveling to exotic places. This is a story about having ideas so outlandish that people think you're joking when you tell them about it. What if we put a camera near space from a weather balloon and film the aurora? This is a story about chasing those ideas, pushing the limits of what you thought was possible. Doing something new means failure isn't an expectation, but a guarantee. If Fairbanks wasn't landlocked, we would have just walked into the ocean. I felt like someone had ripped my heart out and thrown it up into the helicopter blades. This is the story of getting up and doing it again until you succeed. This is the story about reaching the edge, staring into the blackness, and flipping it light side up. I have never felt this uncomfortable in my entire life. Yeah, I see it! Okay, there it is. Oh, we already got a question in the chat. Oh, sweet, awesome. Thanks, Carl, appreciate it. Uh, it's just the link to the full film. Um, so yeah, that's the general concept. It's a very dramatic trailer, but it felt very dramatic at the time. Uh, so I always like to start with kind of how the idea came to be, because it seems like such a weird decision to put like $5,000 worth of camera gear into a styrofoam cooler and then just launch it into the Alaskan wilderness. Um, and it, it kind of started at, uh, Sony does these get togethers called Condo, and it's, it's kind of an ambassador meetup where we all hang out for two or three days. And it's just like this big creative summit, you end up feeling very inspired by the end of it. And I was talking with a couple Sony executives and a friend of mine who works at B&H, and they were all talking about the Aurora Borealis and how beautiful they are. And we all realized that for every single person there, our first time seeing them, was on an airplane while flying to the destination we wanted to go to. And for many of us, we saw them in the airplane and then got on the ground and it was cloudy and we didn't end up actually seeing them on that trip, which was like a very relatable experience. And I would imagine somebody in this group has probably had a similar experience where you, you see them for the first time out of a plane window and it's a really cool view, you know, looking down on the world below you and having these lights above you. And I kind of wanted to build off of that. And my original idea was just to try and like book a flight and film it out the window and make a cool like 30 second video. But I didn't, I don't like shooting through windows. I thought there could be a better way to do it. And I saw a hot air balloon at this event and I just immediately was like, that's the way to go. And the, the first thing I had to do was kind of dive into the research of like, has this been done? Is this even interesting or unique? And I found a lot of people actually launch weather balloons with cameras in them, but it's always just a GoPro and it's always like the middle of the day. And the footage looks really, really cool because, you know, it's like pitch black because you're so you're literally out of the atmosphere, the vast majority of the atmosphere. So it's pitch black sky and then you can see the sun hitting the ground below you. But, you know, it's always a GoPro. So the dynamic range is really poor. So it's literally just like black and then kind of a bluish blob. Uh, I wanted to see a professional caliber camera do it with like a full you know 14 15 stops of dynamic range so you could see the stars and see the planet below you and then the other thing i saw was a lot of you know spinning and dangling just like really uneven footage didn't didn't look great you know it's like handheld versus like having your camera on a, a gimbal stabilizer and so those were the primary challenges that we we set out to overcome i guess for lack of a better word and um, the more I dove into it, the more I realized that there were just so many different layers of things I had to unpack. I started looking into, um, you know, everyone launches from like Ohio, for example. And I was like, well, that far north, is there going to be some unforeseen weather event? We've all heard of the polar vortex that ends up coming south once a year and just obliterating the East Coast in a huge blizzard. So I wanted to make sure that wasn't going to be like, you know, my balloon gets to 80,000 feet and then a 300 mile an hour hurricane just 
shreds it and destroys everything. So I dove into the research there. Um, I reached out to a few professors at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and they were actually super accommodating, which was fun. And they, they were willing to talk me through this. They sent me an amazing amount of upper atmospheric wind data from years past retroactive, like, um, you know, primary research information not readily available online, which was really cool. And they put me in touch with the Poker Flats rocket research range. So the University of Alaska Fairbanks partners up with several different branches of the government, uh, including the military and NOAA and I want to say INSTAR, there's a couple of them, but they, they launch sounding rockets directly into the Aurora Borealis to, to do research on those, to study them. They have major implications for like global communications equipment and such. Uh, and so, I mean, my first question was just, can I put a camera in one of those rockets? Mission accomplished. <laughs> but uh, it turns out, no, you can't, you can't just piggyback on like a $10 million missile. I don't know why. Uh, but they were very, very helpful. I found out that no balloon in human history has ever gotten high enough to be inside the Aurora, which is pretty disappointing that I still think would be an incredible view. But uh, so I, I kind of had to like pare back my expectations a little bit on that. And uh, yeah, they, they walked me through some of this weather, some of the expectations for how high up they were going to be, temperatures. Uh, I realized it's probably going to be about 80 degrees below zero at the top of the flight. So that put another thing on my to-do list is like, how do you keep a camera functioning for three consecutive hours in weather like that? How do you find it again? So I ended up with this just massive to-do list of, of things. And so what came uh, or what started is like, I want to take a neat picture from high up ended up being this huge, huge project. And so uh, that's when I decided to turn this into like a real film and pitch sponsors and try to get, you know, funding to make this an actual project. Um, and if, if anyone's curious, I don't know, um, a lot of the times I give presentations to, to like young, hungry, up and coming photographers who have a lot of questions about the business side. Um, if anyone has questions about that, I'm happy to go into it. But um, for me, I don't think that's maybe quite as interesting as like the science of the Northern Lights and, and flight. But uh, if anyone wants me to go into like the pitching process, I'm happy to do that as well. So um, I guess my first things were kind of calculating the, uh, I'm going to share my screen again here because I wanted to calculate if this was really doable. And I found all these really cool websites and resources. And so there's a bunch of these like highaltitudescience.com, just you can literally put in how much is your payload going to weigh? How much lift do you want it to have? And it'll tell you what's your required helium? How high will you estimate it to go? And this is all just working off physics, right? Atmospheric density, the helium expansion, the balloon you're putting in there, you know, so it says balloon size and grams. And it tells you how fast it's gonna go and how long it'll be up there. And, you know, when I started doing this, I was at like, uh, like, let's see what this looks like. And I realized it's only gonna be like a 73 minute flight. And then I did this, um, you know, and realize that, oh, wow, it's gonna be up there for almost two hours. That's starting to look good. Well, can we slow it down even more? And then, you know, just, I kind of started bouncing ideas around seeing how things were gonna look. You can see that's gonna go 35,000 meters in the air, which is outrageous. Um, this, is a, this is one of the websites that those professors sent me, which is kind of cool. This is more public facing data, but I started looking through different atmospheric levels and which direction it was gonna go. And then my favorite website, this is the one that I probably spent the most time on, is the uh, CUSF landing predictor. I got to move the zoom window so I can see this over here. Uh, but this is a really cool website. So you know, let's zoom back out. Let's go to Denver because this is such a cool website. I encourage you all to go play around with it. Uh, it's on predict.habhub.org. But you can put in your current location. You click set with map and you say that you're going to launch from Rocky Mountain Arsenal. And it will use exact current weather patterns and predict. Oh, I see. I got to hit reload because uh, I had the window open for too long. But it will run. Oh, I got to switch it to tomorrow. I see what the problem is. It'll run the actual prediction based on live wind data and tell you exactly where it's going to take off, what direction it's going to go, where the burst will be, and then where you can expect it to come down. Uh, and I find it to be really 
it was like one of the most important websites that we used in this entire project because you'll see that you pass through several different atmospheric layers, right? It started blowing southeast and then it turned and started heading north. So, you know, there was a point where it was heading directly at several major airports, which obviously would be a huge no-no. It looks like this did uh, fly pretty darn just like directly over DIA, didn't it? So this would be a bad move. You would not want to actually do this. Um, and then beyond that, my number one challenge was stabilization and, and how to deal with that. And I found this really cool article um, that was done as a student research project from the University of Minnesota. And it was actually, this was, it felt like finding a giant chunk of gold in a river on a hike because it was literally payload stabilization for improved photography during stratospheric balloon flights. Like could not be a better find for this project. And um, the reason I'm getting into something so technical is because I was fascinated with how perfectly this applied to our project. And we ended up using a lot of this data from this. So they originally had air scoops dangling off of the payload. So you could see like this was their camera here, kind of like the feathers or the fletchings on an arrow, how it keeps it going straight or the fins on a rocket. But we couldn't do that necessarily because it adds a ton of weight and having this in our shot would be kind of ridiculous. But we went down a little further and they started talking about increasing the moment of inertia by instead of having a single tether up the middle, having four wildly extended tethers off to each side. And so that ended up being actually the way that we ended up doing it was from this article. I ended up drafting, um, let's see here. I know this looks like a nightmare, but I promise it sort of makes sense to me. So this was one of my original sketches. And you can see that that was actually like how I ended up drawing it was with these four tethers extending up to the payload of the parachute up the middle. And so that ended up, that is how we ended up structuring this. And the last piece of the puzzle for us was what camera we were going to use. And at the time that I conceptualized it, there was no Sony a7S III. And I decided to just plan the entire project around Sony announcing the a7S III and crossing my fingers that it would happen. And I got extremely lucky they announced it literally like a month before I was set to go to Alaska. They announced that this camera was going to come to be. And we were fortunate enough um, to be able to take two of them with us. There was only about 10 of them on planet Earth, but Sony was kind enough to sponsor the project and give us uh, two of the 10. We had 20% of the global supply of A7S III's for this project in Alaska at the time, which was pretty exciting uh, for us. And then, uh, yeah, so let me see here. I got some notes. Let me make sure I'm staying on subject here. So um, we started running those simulations. I guess I'll show you some that we actually ran for the project. So we started running those simulations from that website in Fairbanks. And we started having some troubles because Fairbanks is kind of a, a remnant of the Cold War. Um, there's an international airport here, but then there's also a major Air Force base here. There's another Air Force base outpost here. There's an army base down here. Uh, and then there's a bunch of small little airports here. So we're in this like massive conglomerate of airspaces. And you'll notice, so this is September 7th for this one. This is the 17th and those are dramatically different. And then from the 17th to the 18th, just a one day difference, you can see how different those two flights are. And so we started coming up with some calculations on how to manage the airspace restrictions. You're not allowed to fly through commercial airspace with a giant balloon, of course. And so we had to find a way to get over it. This looks like it goes through the Fairbanks airspace, but this is about 100,000 feet in the air right here. That's where it bursts according to that calculation. And so we're actually, this flight is clear. Oop, sorry. This flight is clear, but uh, this one is not, because you'll see that it takes off here. Everything's good here. It's way too high in the air, but you'll notice that this pops and descends directly through the Air Force Base window. And so we started really struggling with how we were going to lay this all out. This one, same thing, uh, ends up looking pretty scary. It's going to burst. And then this like technically should be clear, but also could be not okay at all. And so 
we had to do a lot of balancing on how we were going to, to structure this. And um, I can say retroactively that this ended up being ridiculously accurate. We were shocked watching these flights that they like, you could overlay our GPS coordinates onto one of these models and it would follow it like within maybe a thousand feet either direction, which is in my mind for something just like a balloon floating through the air is crazy. Um, so once we had like kind of this general concept, I'd sketched up a little bit of, you know, the, the payload structure. I picked up some different GPS units. This is me wiring out the, the GPS units for inside the payload. Um, I called a, a sponsor of mine, Breakthrough Photography. They make really great, um, they make filters. Some of you might be familiar with them, but you might not know that they actually own a subsidiary in Denver called Colorado Tripod Company, which is one of my favorite places. This is their storeroom down near South Broadway in Denver. And you can see it's just a playground for photographers. These are all their tripod prototypes, but they have like CNC machines, they have horizontal lathes, they have laser cutters, they have 3D printers. And most importantly, however, their lead engineer has a PhD in mechanical engineering from MIT. And so they ended up being the perfect sponsor for this. And we partnered up together and they started actually drawing up CAD illustrations with me. So this was us all on a Zoom call, living that Zoom life in the year 2020. Um, drawing up, they actually made a full 3D model of an A7S III uh, within a tenth of a millimeter so that we could start specking everything out and drawing up this layout that we were going to use. And then they actually custom fabricated us some mount points and various other apparatus to make this happen. Um, I cannot say thank you enough to them for, for helping with that. Uh, let me see here. Oh, I guess this is also kind of cool just to share. I don't know if this applies to anyone else's photography, but I do have that one GPS unit that I'm slaughtering there right here. And I think it's pretty crazy. This is it. This is as big as it is. This is all um, all the size of the GPS unit that we put in there, which is really cool. So this is a radio transmitter, direct line of sight. So when something's going straight up, you're fine. And then all I have to do is hold this receiver, which Bluetooth pairs to my phone, and I can see exactly where the payload is anywhere on planet Earth. And then we backed that up by using a Garmin InReach Mini. So uh, we had redundancy on our GPS, not just in terms of um, two GPS units, but also different transmission methods. So this one's radio direct to my phone. And the Garmin uses the Iridium satellite network to transmit. So I just figured that was a great way to have some, some redundancy on if one failed, we have a second one. And if one of them failed due to like a system error, the second one is a completely different system because I would hate for there to just be radio interference that I didn't foresee. And then that ends up being the reason that neither of them work or something like that. Uh, I also did a lot of weird tests in the, the run up to this. I, I put my A7S3, I actually have the camera that we ended up flying uh, right next to me. So I, I put in two memory cards and a battery and then I just hit record and I just set it on my coffee table and let it run until the battery run out to see if it would overheat filming uh, in 4K video. It didn't, which is cool. It filled one card, rolled directly into the next one, which is exactly what I wanted. Uh, I plugged it into an external power source to see if it would record for six hours straight and it did. And then I followed up and I literally put it in the freezer in my apartment and recorded again for another five hours to see if it would survive. And it did, which was awesome. Um, I couldn't find anywhere that can get down to 80 below zero, unfortunately, uh, other than like the dry ice cooler at Costco, but it seemed like an unnecessary risk to go put a camera in the dry ice cooler at a store like Costco just to see if it works in the cold. So, um, but I, the name of the game and anything experimental and, and trying to push the boundaries is to account for as many variables as possible and try to you know, test those. Theoretical is great. Uh, you know, we had it in a styrofoam cooler, which is insulatory. We put some of those hand warmer packets in there to help keep it warm. So in theory, it works, but it's always good to try and test things very literally. And uh, you can only do so much, of course, depending on your budget. But uh, just for anything that anyone tries to do, if you're trying to do anything new, even if it's just like go to Africa on a safari, for example, using a conversation we were having earlier, it's always good to think about all your possible variables and try to test them before you get there. You don't want your first time using a new memory card to be on the Savannah, right? So that's just kind of like general advice that I take with me in every project now. 
Um, let's see. So we also had to test. Uh, I have another couple clips, I guess, of us testing various things. Uh, oh, I'd like to play the animation we have of the stabilization, which is kind of cool. Uh, my girlfriend made this for the film, but it probably does a better job of explaining those four bars uh, than I did. The industry standard for weather balloons is to attach the payload via a single tether, but this creates an unstable pendulum motion, even in perfectly calm conditions. By using carbon fiber rods to extend the payload diameter, we increase the moment of inertia and it makes the payload more resistant to swiveling. From there, attaching the payload to the balloon with four independent tethers dramatically reduces side to side sway during the flight. Hopefully that was a little bit more digestible. Um, and let's see here. So this is also, this is another kind of a good example. Let me full screen this here. Another, I guess, example of us uh, kind of testing things. So this is the first cooler I bought, some very thin ultralight carbon fiber rods. And I put about 10 pounds inside the box to see if it would work. And um, you can see it doesn't really work. That is not what you want. So kind of had to go back to the drawing board a little bit on, on this. Um, these were the very early days of testing, which is kind of fun. You can see my incredible Chaco tan. I'm very proud of that. Summer was always good. Uh, and so I doubled them up. I realized that maybe decreasing the moment of inertia, making a little bit of a sacrifice on the strength to weight ratio. And suddenly it's starting to look pretty good. This is starting to look like an actual cooler. Um, the other thing we wanted to test was the, the parachute deployment. So one of the things I was concerned about, if we scroll back on this, is that the parachute attaches right here in the middle of the cooler and then goes straight up. And I was a little concerned that these four strings on the outside wouldn't allow the parachute to fully open. But the thing that concerned me the most is that the balloon we were using weighs 3,000 grams, which is about 6.6 .6 pounds. And in theory, when it bursts, it basically full on detonates and you're not carrying much of it back. But I'd read some stories about it just sort of like opening at the top and then that full six pound weight sits on top of your parachute for the full flight back down. And so we kind of constructed a scale model here. So we have this pill bottle and I put some quarters in it to simulate like the worst case scenario, like an eight pound balloon sitting on top of the parachute. And it was not really to scale. This would have been like a 15 pound balloon, but um, you know, we wanted to account for the worst case scenario. So my girlfriend and I took it to the nearest bridge closest to our house. I'm sure we looked like absolute psychopaths to everybody who was walking by that day and uh, dropped it off as a test. And this is exactly what you don't want to see from a test like that, which is scary. <laughs> so back to the drawing board, got everything to work. Uh, this was great. This was a big moment for us. I'm sure this made us look even crazier, dropping a little parachute box off a bridge and then cheering like hooligans. But uh, that's a nice soft touchdown. I even toyed a little bit um, with a barometric parachute release mechanism, but uh, that's not really the most exciting video, but it just kind of shows the less moving parts you can have, the better. So we ended up settling on, again, this system of just having it straight up the middle like that. Uh, from those tests, it seemed like this wasn't gonna impact anything. And that's much, much lower risk. So. From there, we headed to Fairbanks and we spent the Anywhere next, here I'll mute this, Anderson I don't really need here. to hear what he's saying, but we spent the next couple of weeks looking at all of these airspace maps. So you can see all of these are restricted airspace, every single one of these circles. So uh, when I say that there's a lot of airspace restrictions in Fairbanks, it is very serious. Uh, our partner Austin here is a licensed pilot. So he's he was our man, our go-to man for this. Uh, all of this is airspace restriction and this huge area here is a military use zone. So we started balancing all of that, looking at where we could take off from. And then from there, we actually, we had to move on to weather predictions. And this was probably the worst part when we first got there, there was a major storm inbounds. And uh, this website's called windy.com, by the way, this uh, is, probably one of the best websites you can use as a photographer. It'll show you everything, this drop down menu on the right side. If you look, you can see it says radar and satellite, wind, rain, thunder, thunder, temperature, clouds, air quality. 
I use it for predicting sunsets, uh, astrophotography. If it's kind of cloudy and you want to see if it can clear up later, it's all very useful. But looking at the wind developing, we noticed like on the surface, it was kind of low and it was blowing to the west. But then as I move this slider up, you can go through different elevations. You can move up to, I think it goes up to 60,000 feet or 80,000 feet on windy. And you'll notice as I move the slider here in a second, that the wind goes on the ground from blowing west pretty slow to blowing north at about 70 miles an hour. And then it just turns into hurricane force winds as you get higher into the atmosphere. And so we spent about a week there just constructing our, our payloads. Um, when they showed up, they were just literally this. We had styrofoam coolers. And you can see these are like, this is the top spreader for attaching to the balloon. These are the little X braces for mounting those carbon fiber rods to the bottom of the cooler. And so we had just this massive amount anywhere of in. preparation to do um, and cutting holes and things. But before we could fly, we had a lot of unpacking and assembly and construction to do. Styrofoam is worse than a skin disease. It is. Make sure this still goes through that hole with all these adjustments. Yeah, and the uh, tape. Yeah. Oh, that tray doesn't go all the way to the front, huh? No. So that, there's just a little bit of, of that. Um, something else that we did is we were worried about putting, so we had, let me back up a little bit. We had, this was basically the layout inside the cooler. So we have the A7S3 with the 20 millimeter F1.8. This is our Garmin GPS. This is that featherweight GPS and then an external battery pack. Um, for the second flight, this is a little bit of foreshadowing for those of you who haven't seen the film. This anchor was also plugged into the Garmin GPS unit to keep it powered. Major oversight on our part to not do that on the first flight. But our concern was we had this hole cut in the cooler. Um, you can see here, that's where the lens pokes out of the cooler. Uh, and we were concerned that sticking it through that was going to change the focus or change the aperture. This is one of those lenses that has full manual options. And we were kind of concerned that, that might do it. So we manually focused this lens during the daytime and then used electrical tape to tape the focus ring so it wouldn't move. So then when we finally stuff it through that hole, it would, uh, you know, hopefully stay focused. That's Another one of those things is just like so horrifying on the ground, the thought of everything goes perfectly and you get it back and like the focus ring had gotten turned and there's just no usable footage whatsoever. So we were trying to account for all of that. And then another thing that we tried to yeah, the, account for in this scenario is the camera itself is tethered directly to the GPS unit and directly to this main base plate. And then that is connected to the parachute itself so that worst case scenario say that uh f-16 from the air force base hits the cooler and the rods obliterate the styrofoam cooler obliterates the camera itself is directly attached to the parachute the parachute is not attached to the cooler or the rods or anything it's the camera so that even it just fully make it attached to the parachute hopefully would return to earth with a gps unit tethered to it so that was our hope and then we wrapped everything inside in a plastic bag um, as you can maybe see from here, there are some serious water features, uh, the Tanana River, and then further to the north, the Yukon River. It was a major concern from some of these uh, where we were gonna be crossing it three or four times. And we're you know, just on the off chance that something went wrong, if the balloon burst way earlier, like down here, and we ended up landing in this river, we wanted the ability for the camera to survive and float and be dry when we just wait for it to like cross the bridge here, you know? Um, so. We packed it up inside this silly thing uh, in, a, in a plastic bag inside the styrofoam cooler. It was the most ridiculous and least scientific looking thing I could possibly imagine, but that is, uh, that's where we landed. And then after all that, it was time to get going. So we went to our launch site. Uh, we finally found them, we got a good weather window and we did the construction portion. Um, there was a lot to do still. We had to tie all the strings to these little rods we had to uh, string everything out, get the parachute attached. Here I am wearing my headlamp, uh, <laughs> tying these tiny little kite strings 
Uh, oh yeah, this is kind of a fun one. So this is a, just a time lapse I did of us. You can see us set everything up and then we sit in the car and watch Netflix while we waited for it to get dark. And then we went back out and inflated the balloon. I'm always a sucker for a time lapse. I feel like they really tell fun stories. So you can see the cooler sitting there. And then it starts to get dark. We all come out and it's go time. So uh, yeah, just a couple shots of us, I guess, getting set up for those who haven't seen it. You know, there's us pulling the helium tanks out. Um, this was the cooler at sunset getting ready for inflating the balloon. Here we are inflating it. The balloons are enormous. It is uh, kind of hard to believe how big they are. I knew it was gonna be a big one, but I just wasn't prepared for that. It's mind boggling. Uh, these are a little out of order, sorry. That's me attaching it to the filler stringing out the uh the top spreader so the balloon attached directly to this white piece of plastic that i'm holding in my hand so that's the very top of it and the parachute's going to attach right there in the middle and then come back to the box here uh there i am untangling some knots this is the fully inflated balloons we just took the filler out of it we're getting ready to seal it off and for me this is the scariest part of the entire project because this had about if I remember correctly, 13 pounds of upward lift. And so 13 pounds is not like a ton of weight, but when you have to hold it for 30 minutes like this, it starts to get really tiring. Um, there's about $600 worth of helium inside that balloon, and it's about a $400 balloon in its own right. So the thought of letting go of it is truly horrifying. And um, I actually have Let's see here, what's the best example? So this is one of the things I got in the habit of doing is we actually taped a tether to the balloon and I carabineered it to my belt. because so I figured that it would have to just rip my pants off if it was gonna get away from me before we were ready to fly. Um, <clears throat> and then this was us getting ready for the first flight. Balloon almost fully inflated, just about ready to go. There's a better example if you're having trouble visualizing how the, uh, the balloon attaches to this top spreader these four little arms go down to the payload and then the parachute is right in the center of that. Um, and then well, I guess this has a good example of it all set up and ready to go so we can kind of watch this. And there's the strobe just flashing in Autumn's face so she's half blind. Nate had carabinered himself to the balloon and then he looked over at me and he's like, okay, cut it, cut it, let it go. And I just panicked. I was like, what, wait, what, what? And I, I feel like I blacked out. Strangely enough on that first flight, I had, uh, the rest of that sentence is strangely enough on that first flight, I had 100% confidence that we did everything right. And it turns out in retrospect, that was not accurate. So spoiler alert, um, that first flight, it took off great. The shocking thing to me is that the balloon ascends at a uh, thousand feet per minute. So it's kind of crazy, right? But um, you know, we got about 120,000 feet in the air and it only takes about two hours if you remember from those, or yeah, two hours if you remember from that simulation I showed earlier. Uh, so by the time we packed everything up and got in the car, it was already 20,000 feet in the air. So it feels so much more hectic. I don't know, in my mind, I was expecting, I heard two hours and I was like, ah, well, get home and we'll relax and we'll drink a beer and we'll check the GPS. And it was, by the time we got back, it was already at 70,000 feet. And it was like, oh my God, it's happening. <laughs> um, and we, we had a little bit of a calculation error and still to this day, I'm not entirely sure what exactly went wrong. My current theory is that there was a little bit of a, a cold front high up that was unpredicted or unaccounted for, probably a personal error. Um, cause the balloon is supposed to go up. Do I have the animation in here of it's how it's supposed to go up and burst and come down? I guess I don't. Um, well, anyhow, a balloon is supposed to go up and it expands continuously as it rises. And eventually it gets to the point where it can't expand anymore. And then it explodes and comes back down on its parachute, but something happened and the balloon expanded and then just hit stasis and stopped expanding and stopped rising. And so this reading, 117,000 feet, we got two of them in a row, three of them in a row, 
And then we got three hours of them in a row. So you'll notice this says 4.30 a.m. and it's still reading at 117,000 feet going 72 miles per hour. And at this point, it's already like 250 miles outside of town. Um, it's something fairly common in ballooning called a floater. It's considered like the biggest mistake you can make in the ballooning world, short of like hitting a commercial airliner. Uh, not very proud of myself for that one, unfortunately. It did eventually burst. You'll see here, this is at 5.20 a.m. These are all travel marks. It burst right around here and you can see it start to come down. And then right here is the last GPS beacon that we received um, because it was nearly hundred degrees below zero up there and it spent three and a half, four hours at that altitude. The best I can think is that the batteries on everything froze. Like I said, I did hours of tests in cold weather but never a hundred degrees below zero. It was the one variable I didn't account for um, just because I never considered that we would need four hours of battery life at a hundred degrees below zero. Um, you know, the hand warmers pooped out, the styrofoam cooler, you no know, styrofoam cooler is meant to insulate in those kinds of conditions. And so at 48,000 feet above the ground, which is way lower than 117,000, but still definitely not back down. This uh, was our last GPS beacon. So it was a very sad three hours of sleep and I woke up and I did some math. I ran a couple more simulations. So I tried to plan one where this burst lined up with our last GPS coordinate at 48,000 feet. So I actually ran a simulation. Uh, I put in all the right data to try and make it go. This is the meters equivalent of 48,000 feet. So that the burst was at the same location and the same altitude as our last GPS coordinate. And I tried to extrapolate. You can see on this one, it heads like due east and then curves to the north and then eventually back to the northwest. And so we took this and we we're like, okay, so it'll take this line, it'll go over this way and then eventually curl up here. And so we dropped some pins on the map. Uh, and so this is the actual map. So from Fairbanks, it took off over here and it flew all the way down here this star is our last uh, known GPS coordinate. And, or sorry, the star is the burst. And this is our last known GPS coordinate. And from there we extrapolated using that simulation I showed. This was what I predicted to be the potential outcome. This was uh, our northernmost extremity. And then we figured if there was swirling ground winds, it could have gone this far west. And so we drew this recovery area, which seemed like pretty, pretty good odds uh, in our mind of like where it could have possibly been. And then we did the math on this. And this is three and a half times the size of the city of Chicago. And we're looking for a styrofoam cooler that's two feet in diameter. Um, so <laughs> odds were not good. The closest town to these coordinates is a town right over here named Chicken, which has 12 year round residents. Just to give you an idea of how remote that is, the closest town has 12 year-round residents. So we got in our helicopter, we went to go try and recover this balloon, and um, we, you know, we, we had a budget for this. We had some sponsors, like I said, you know, Sony sponsored us, Breakthrough Photography sponsored us, Explore Fairbanks, the, the tourism board in Alaska had sponsored us, but they gave us a budget for all of our recoveries, we were planning on trying to do three flights of $3,000, so about $1,000 each. And this first recovery attempt cost us $3,500. So we blew our entire budget on the first one. And there is still to this day, a Sony a7S III in a styrofoam cooler in Alaska. Um, we were not able to find it. It was uh, probably the worst day of all of 2020, which is quite a statement for me personally, of course, I'm sure other people unfortunately had much worse days that year, but um, yeah, it was, it was a really devastating experience. And so I'm gonna be honest, we like, we all felt pretty sad about that. And we really struggled because there was only, like I said, 10 A7S threes maybe in the world. And we only had two of them and we just lost one. We just lost 10% of the global supply of this brand new camera. Um, but strangely enough, Sony, uh, my sponsor at Sony was the one who convinced us to go again. You know, I talked to her on the phone and she was like, what did you go there for, man? Are you going to just give up? Uh, and I, I can't thank her enough for that encouragement because I honestly 
was kind of ready to like call it a day and head home. You know, we just spent thousands and thousands of dollars and lost a camera and had nothing to show for it. And I was like, do we want to spend another several thousand dollars and risk losing both of the cameras? Um, so we did it again. We built another payload. Um, it was unbelievably disheartening trying to construct another payload from scratch after we just built one because it was like 17 hours of construction the first time uh but we did it and so uh we did it again we went out to a field another uh payload time lapse is us inflating the balloon it looks super weird up close uh this is a little bit of a better example of how it goes my favorite part of this little time lapse is so you can see that we release we release the balloon right there and then we start packing everything up. And if you'll notice in the sky, look at that. The Aurora Borealis starts happening minutes after we release it. There's nothing, let go of the balloon and there it is, lights up. And then there's a little bit of a shot. This is footage from inside the camera as we let go. That was a... Uh, a scary moment let it go of that second one i gotta tell you <laughs> so um oh yeah here's another that's me with it tethered to my belt loop you can see <laughs> just looking like an absolute really close lunatic okay. right okay that's fine okay. so there's a better example of the structure of our, our stabilizer um austin and i trying to figure out how we want to do everything yep. and, you know remember there's about 15 pounds of upward force on our hands there so it feels very scary uh, I pull out my phone and make sure both GPS units are transmitting and tracking. The camera is already recording at this point. So I have like 20 minutes of my own stomach filmed here, but you know, better safe than sorry. Had a little bit of a GPS error, so. Where is it? Oh, I see it. Okay, both GPS systems are good. We're facing north. Yeah, ish. Turn a little north. Okay, you ready? And my hands are off. Underneath it. I'm just okay. going to release. Okay. Okay. Like one, two, three, and go. Yeah. It always shocks me how quick those go up when you let go of them. Um, I did forget to mention something really cool about the design of this that I, I actually want to touch on a little bit. So one of the other cool uh, or one of the other challenges we had to overcome was the temperature gradient outside, you know, trying to keep your camera warm while it's so cold outside. If anyone here's ever photographed something like polar bears or the northern lights somewhere really, really cold, um, bringing your warm camera outside, it'll all cool down at slightly different rates and so you'll actually have like an hour of weird out of focus images as like the, the lens barrel shrinks but the glass elements stay the same size until they all kind of settle in and uh reach equilibrium and so that was a major concern of ours was that we were going to get like ice forming on the front of the camera itself and so one of the other things that was cool about breakthrough photography is they custom machined this front filter element here uh, for us. And so the 20 millimeter has a 67 millimeter front filter, and they got us a super high transmissivity, clear glass filter that threads into the lens. And then threading into that with male threads is this massive, I think it's about a hundred millimeter, uh, disc, but it's kind of an offset flange. So the outside of it is on the outside of the box to make an airtight seal. And then we taped over it to like help seal that even more but the inside is through to the lens itself. And then there's more female threads on the inside of this. So it's kind of like a double or a triple pane window in your house, like those ultra high energy efficiency windows where there's multiple layers of glass separating, but they're all extremely high caliber, like cinema grade clear filters. So not just for protecting the lens, but actually preventing that temperature gradient from affecting anything. Uh, and I thought that was like one of the coolest ideas that they had over there. And I'm sorry for forgetting that when I was talking about the payload design, but I think that was, that was really cool. Um, and then we came back and we just watched. We're currently at 
this tick in. Uh, we took some footage of the screen when it hit 117,000 feet because that is our bad luck number on this second flight. Um, and we just sat there checking our GPS units. And uh, you've never seen three people so stressed out. The locations are in Yukon a little bit to the east of us, but I have no doubt right now that we're capturing the aura. I mean, we're seeing 350 balloons. Yeah. I have no doubt in my mind that right now we are capturing the aura of the aura. From 110,000 feet, we're absolutely seeing. Well, and watching this geophysical institute footage, it's it's over us right now. It's horizon to horizon. So that was one of the things the geophysical institute does a live webcam, so we could actually see, you know, where it was. We just sat there, just checking, just checking our footage, um, and eventually, you know, it hit one hundred and twenty thousand feet, and it stayed there for three consecutive readings, which was like the ultimate panic attack. But eventually the balloon burst, it came down, everything functioned exactly as it's supposed to. And uh, we went out to get it the next day. And I, this clip is, is kind of funny. This has not a whole lot to do with the photography side of things, but this is our helicopter pilot, Mike. He's just like the epitome of every person in Alaska, which I think is so funny. Um, he, we land and he just goes, it's grizzly country and whips out one of the biggest shotguns I've ever seen in my life. So. <laughs> We're here getting ready. To, we're like all so excited. We're so happy. And he's like, oh, hell no, I'm not walking into the woods. Here's a giant gun. Hope you don't die. It's just like a hilarious, uh, hilarious cherry on top for a, <laughs> for a project like this. Um, yeah, we hiked down and we got it. Here's a, some footage of us recovering it. Yep. We can fast it forward. says we are fast forward a little bit. It's a five minute video, but it's cool to see how it landed, I think. And again, we're in grizzly country during the time of year. They're the most hungry. So walking through these woods was a little bit scary, but it's OK. Cool. Didn't do a very good job of trimming that one, did ah. I? Yes. Look at that balloon remnant. Look at that. Oh my gosh, that's all that's left. <laughs> Ugh. It still smells like the world's grossest condom. Wow, it didn't explode. I knew it was all the way. Look at that. Look at that. So anyhow, that was it. Oh, we got a, a chat question here. Oh, cool. I'm glad you're enjoying it, Laura. Thank you. Um, well, I guess let's get into some of the footage, huh? So I guess really quick, this was what it was looking like on the ground the night we flew, which I think is pretty fun. Um, we were looking through some clouds, but we could see that it was happening, which was fun. I'm a sucker for time lapses. But uh, let's get into the actual flight footage. That's what we're all here for. So I have these labeled for different altitudes as we went up, which I think is really kind of fun. So here's 65,000 feet. The air wasn't quite as stable there. So there's still a little bit of swing, but it's, it actually, I kind of like it. This is like enough motion that makes it interesting in my opinion. And then from 85,000 feet, this one's one of my favorites. I think this one looks so cool. We just got this sharp purple ribbon on the bottom, just dancing. From 85,000 feet, so twice the height of any commercial airliner, three times the height of Everest almost. And then here's the top of our flight. This was our peak elevation, 122,000 feet. Um, and you'll see that here's where we like truly accomplished our mission. It's, it's tripod stable almost. Uh, the crazy thing here is that 
the balloon is traveling at almost 90 miles an hour at this point. But because you're so high above the surface of the earth, there's zero turbulence. It's just perfectly laminar flow. So the balloon's going 90 miles an hour, but it's perfectly stable, pointed right at it. You can see the constellation Orion right here. Um, this is probably the video clip that I'm most proud of, of anything I've ever captured in my entire life. Um, I think it's cool, you know? There's only, I guess, three people that have ever got that shot. And it, um, I'll just never get tired of seeing these like tiny little cities down here. It's really cool. And then, yeah, I guess that's, uh, that's more or less it, unless anybody has any questions and I can try to dig some stuff up to touch on some more. So, so Nate, how did you know which way it was, you know, the camera is gonna be oriented? I mean, it was just dumb luck, you know? Yeah, so that was, that's a great question. And it was something we talked about. We originally tried to design maybe sort of like a gyroscope or a gimbal of some sort to keep it oriented north. But one of the reasons we settled on Fairbanks is that it's directly under what they call the Aurora Oval. And so the Aurora Borealis doesn't happen on the North Pole. It happens in like a donut shape at about 65 degrees latitude. And that varies depending on the strength of the storm and various other factors. But the cool thing in, a, in Fairbanks is that because you're in the Aurora Oval, it happens directly overhead, horizon to horizon in every direction. And so we decided to keep the weight reasonable on this balloon to not have any active control and just kind of let it point whatever direction it was. And we, we did luck out, the Aurora was strong enough that night um, if you watch the full length film, there's a point where the camera rotates about 270 degrees really slowly. And there's Aurora in the shot continuously the entire time, pretty much the whole sky was full. So we, we were fortunate that we didn't need it. It would have been really disappointing if it was only to the North that night or something, but yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. It's a great question. Anybody else? I guess I can talk about the camera settings. Um, so obviously 20 millimeter lens at F 1.8, we did wide open because the name of the game was getting it as, getting as much light into the camera as possible. So F 1.8 is what we shot at. Uh, we were filming in 4K, 10 bit 422. If anyone here does video, that means something to you. If you don't know what that means, it's not super relevant. Um, it's basically like the video version of shooting raw, I guess, uh, just higher bit depth, more dynamic range. Um, the interesting thing on video is that you always want your shutter speed to be half or sorry, twice. I don't really know how to phrase that of your frame rate. So we're filming it at 24 frames per second. So ideally you would want a 1 50th shutter speed. And that's for every like cinema film you've ever seen. Uh, there are some notable exceptions, but in general, the rule of thumb is to have like 1 50th of a second shutter for 24 frames per second. We chose to forego that and kind of break convention and we did 1 25th of a second. So basically the shutter was open the entire time for every single frame that we filmed, which would make way too much motion blur if you were doing like sports videography or something or like dancers, something with a lot of motion. But for uh, something like this, that's slow motion and the name of the game is getting as much light as possible. So doing half the, the shutter speed gives us twice as much light. So that was the choice we made there. And then um, the cool thing about this A7S III is those clips that I just shared, I'm gonna show them again really quick so that everyone can appreciate how astonishing this is. Uh, we were at 102,000 ISO. So this was filmed at 102,000 ISO, uh, 1 25th of a second shutter speed. So I just think that's pretty incredible that cameras can do that nowadays. Um, you know, my first digital camera I bought, I would never shoot above ISO like 800 because it looked terrible. So this is, it's just, it still blows my mind. I think that's really, really amazing. All right, anybody else have other questions? I was, I was just gonna make a comment that the, the video that we're seeing here in Zoom um, is degraded a bit because of, of Zoom. So. When I, I'd encourage everybody to, you know, hit that link that I, I gave in the chat. Um, go and watch the the video on YouTube because the quality is much better. And uh, yeah, it, it is truly amazing 
the the images you capture and the video you captured it's it's wild it's it's beautiful thank you yeah that's a good point yeah on youtube it's in full 4k it's much better quality than over zoom yep Hey, this is Dave. I just wanted to say that I'm I'm so impressed with uh, with the with all of the the little details that you had to account for, and kind of you know almost a little bit of exploration and almost like a, a science project that you you pulled off. And I mean, I can understand how it was so disheartening to lose that that first balloon and camera, but you know, thanks to Sony, I mean, they encouraged you. It's kind of like, ah, hey, it's only money. Go for it, dude. You know, but I, it's amazing all the work that you guys put into this collectively. Thank you. Yeah, it was uh, almost a year from concept to execution, and then another three months of uh, editing the video and everything to get it together. So it, it basically consumed my life for fifteen or sixteen months. It was a huge undertaking, but uh, yeah, it was it was so gratifying. We when we finally got that that cooler back our plan was to take it back to the hotel room and like watch it on a full size laptop. And we, we couldn't even wait. And we were sitting in a, a restaurant in Fairbanks drinking a beer with our camera, just sitting on the table. <laughs> and uh, we called our waiter over and we're like, look at this, check out what we filmed. And he couldn't even wrap his brain around what he was looking at. He was like, wait, from a balloon, what? But uh, <laughs> it was funny. You should have seen how we were just deliriously excited that we finally succeeded. So what's the next project? So this did lead into a different project, another equally harebrained idea. I don't know where they come from, but every now and then my subconscious just vomits something outlandish into my brain. And then uh, I am working on something, but I am fortunate to be able to say that I can't talk about it because it seems to be coming to life. Um, so um, I can say that it is significantly larger in scope than this one, which is exciting. And it does also involve the Northern Lights, which is cool. Um, but so we'll stay tuned. Yes, please, please, please. I uh, Hopefully the, uh, the theory is that you will be able to watch it on uh, Netflix is right. the biggest news. So it should be very easy to find. Cool. It's like the, the ultimate science fair project there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. And if anyone's going to Alaska, let me know. I'll send you the GPS coordinates if you feel like renting a helicopter and you want to try and find that cooler. <laughs> <laughs> there's a uh, there's still a hopefully still a 10 foot red parachute attached to it. So I think if somebody flies over it, they'll see it. We just didn't fly over it. I guess we spent like three or four hours combing that area and couldn't see it. Cause I mean, you know, it's like, think about losing something somewhere between like Leadville and Grand Junction. Yeah. How on earth are you going to find that? <laughs> did, did you have your name in it or phone number or anything? Yeah. Yeah. But okay. yeah, we'll see. I mean, who knows? Maybe it'll be 15 years from now. Right. Well, yeah, I was just going to say any other um, projects or work, you know, that you have posted out there or sit on your, on your website or, Oh yeah, that's a great question. So my website is nateluby.com and then I'm on the internet as Nate in the Wild. So you can find me almost anywhere with those okay. two names. Um, I do a bunch of workshops uh, around the world throughout the year. I would love to see anybody join it on one of them if, if you have any interest in that. Um, my next one, I'm heading back to Churchill for polar bears and then we're heading to Norway for a Northern Lights workshop in February. Um, both of those are sold out, but they're they're annual so you can sign up for future years. Um, and then lots of different projects. I did one with Visit Bend that should be coming out next week. And then I'm heading to Southern California for a project in uh, about two weeks. And I'm sure you sell some of your, your prints online as well. I mean, your, your website's spectacular. Thank you. So. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. That's the second time you've had to remind me. I'm so bad at self-promotion, <laughs> but um, I do want to mention, yeah, we, we got some prints. I'll, I have it over here. Thanks to Dave for reminding me again, but we have these prints actually from the flight. They're for sale on my website. They're signed and numbered by all three members of the team. So we only did 50 of them, I believe. Yeah, we only did 50 of them. So you can get a signed numbered limited edition print. Uh, it's on museum archival paper. Um, we're pretty proud of them. They look really, really awesome. So those are on my website if anyone's interested in having some art, but then I also do sell landscape and wildlife photos as well. 
So Nate, what are your responsibilities with uh, with Sony? I mean, I'm sure you're at various promotional if your yeah. role is in a, as, a, as an ambassador. Yeah, it's it's nice because none of them are like full on responsibilities. Like nothing's mandatory, but it's all a lot of voluntary stuff, which is fun. So um, we have a lot of open communication. I'll tell them what's coming up and they can tell me if they have a product they think would be a good fit. And, um, you know, they, they always chip in to help finance things, which is really awesome. Uh, every now and then I'll get something new. Like uh, I was one of the first people to get this 20 millimeter F1.8 lens. And so... Uh, and also that 12 to 24 F 2.8 that came out last year, uh, my girlfriend and I were, you know, one of the first five people to get it. And so when they did the launch announcement, it was my photo they used for the, for the press conference, which was a huge honor. So stuff like that, you know, they'll say, here's a new lens. We think it's right up your alley. We'll take it out. We'll do some shots and we'll use those for the promotional assets. Um, and then, yeah, beyond that, some speaking engagements, if there's a conference in town or, uh, you know, they've flown me to New York to speak at like the Photo Plus Expo, things like that. And then just in general, it's, uh, you know, kind of just knowing the answer. They, uh, you know, my main responsibility, I guess, is just to endorse Sony. Uh, if people have questions about them when I'm out in the field, which happens a lot more now than it used to, since they, they've they really established a name for themselves. You wouldn't believe how often I'm just out taking photos and somebody asks about the camera and is thinking about switching. But yeah, it's uh, it's fun and then every now and then we also all get to sit down with the engineers they have a really cool open line of communication so i've i've gotten to sit down with their engineers they flew in from japan and just tell them everything i hate about the camera <laughs> and then everything i love also um and then you know they like they'll take notes and they'll improve things and it's really it's really a sight to behold how like hands-on and, and interested they are in getting that real feedback well it sounds like you've got a great relationship with them I do. Yeah. I was fortunate to be one of the first uh, 25 ambassadors when they started fleshing out the Alpha Collective program back in the day. So I've been there since the very start, which is cool. And so I have, yeah, I have a really a nice relationship with them and they, they trust me and I trust them, which is great. And if they didn't kick me out for losing an unreleased camera in the wilderness, they aren't going to do it now, hopefully. <laughs> and then I guess one last plug, this is not sponsored, but um, as a bunch of Colorado photographers, I would encourage you to check out Colorado Tripod Company because they're local. It's always fun to support local. And uh, I genuinely do love that tripod. I'm, I'm pretty obsessed with it. So if anyone likes to, to shop local, they're really, really amazing quality stuff. So is it a retail location where you can go in and, and look at things and buy tripod if, if you're so inclined? Um, it's not. It's really like an R&D and fabrication facility, but okay. they're... They're very cool people. And I'm sure if you told them that you're a, a passionate photographer and you're a member of a camera club, they would love to have you in and show you around. You know, they're they're way bigger camera nerds than any of us here. And so any excuse they can have to chat cameras with somebody else who's interested, they will take you up on it. Yeah, I may replace my wooden tripod one of these days. We'll, we'll see. Whoa, wooden. That's that's actually pretty old, cool. Old school. No, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> for, for your large format camera right Dave this exactly is, yeah. <laughs> but I just wanted to say thank you again it, it's always interesting to me to, to see kind of what's behind the scenes of a project and that was a hell of a project I you know I, I don't think that there's many people on the planet that that had that idea so I, I applaud you and thank you very much for sharing this sharing with us the background and like Carl said I think you know, to see this in a 4K on, on YouTube, um, I'm definitely going to check it out. So thank you. Cool. Yeah, thanks for, for having me in. This was fun. All right. Take care. All righty. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thanks day. a lot, Nate. Thanks for thank you very much, Nate. Yeah. Good night, Nate. Bye-bye.